Welcome to Discovering. It's that time of year when the woods begins to offer up some tasty forest edibles. It's only available for a very short window every year, generally around Mother's Day here in Iron Mountain. Then we'll catch up on our coyote tanning project. And Kristen was in Copper Harbor for a trails cleanup project. Raking leaves and picking up sticks, that's just about it. <laughs> We're also scaring chipmunks. Stick around, it's time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. It's spring, and if you know where to look and what to look for, Mother Nature is dishing out all sorts of tasty treats. One of those delicacies is fiddlehead ferns. So it's fiddlehead fern season, and what that looks like is you have to find the right plant. This is an ostrich fern. And before they become these giant stegosaurus buffets, they are tightly coiled inside of a paper wrapping. And they come from a central point. There are many different kinds of ferns, so it's important to know that you have the right one. And here's one of the key identifying factors. One, they're going to be in a wet place. This is sandy, wet, loamy soil. We're in a flood plain right now next to the Menominee River, so it's obviously a very wet place. Two, you're gonna see last year's growth. What that looks like is this. And they grow from a central spot. This is called a corm, right, or a rhizome. And it basically is like a bulb, almost like a potato. It stores energy for the winter and then in the spring produces shoots, right? Same principle here. Uh, as far as I know, the corm is not edible. Neither is the rest of this fern once it is unfurled. However, whenever it is still tightly coiled inside of here before all this grows up, it is a beautiful, wonderful, little delicious treat. It tastes like a mixture between asparagus and green beans. There are other types of ferns that are in our forest, but they're gonna be noticeably different. They don't grow in these low wet spots. And they also generally look like they have prickly little hairs on the stems of them. These don't, if you look at them, they're very smooth. And whenever they're tightly wrapped, in particular, these have that bronze, copper, brownish paper around the outside, which has to be removed as part of the wash process. It's actually easier to do it dry than wet. So what you do is when you pick it, you just take it and kind of do this like you would garlic, and that peel comes right off. Just nice and easy, just kind of roll it around and, and poof, it's all gone and put it in your bucket and then do a wash afterwards. And that's the easiest way to clean them. The, you do have to do some prep work though. You have to parboil them, which means you have to boil them and throw out the water and rinse them off before you can eat them. And that's because of a hyperaccumulation of iron that occurs, right? They are incredible after you do that. If you don't do that step, you may have some gastrointestinal distress that you do not find very comforting. Uh, my favorite thing to do with them is because they happen during the beginning of morel season and leeks or ramps are in season at the same time is make eggs benedict with this is my asparagus and my morels, I saute them in the butter. Uh, and then I also have my leeks in there in that butter. And then I make the butter into hollandaise later. And so uh, this is kind of a, a key figure to our diet. Now this is a very, very ephemeral food. It's only available for a very short window every year, generally around Mother's Day here in Iron Mountain. And it's literally a week, maybe two week harvest window at the very most. So it's, it's something that when they're in season, you gotta go out there and pick them and put them up for the rest of the year. And we have some back of the farm that we picked earlier in the week. And in a matter of five days, they have gone from uh, harvestable to completely unharvestable. And that's how fast it happens. A little bit of rain goes a long way in a hurry. I was back in the garage with Dave for a look at the next step in tanning a coyote hide. When we left off last week, the coyote was flushed, salted, washed, and pickled. It's been in the pickle for three days now. We're going to do the 
the final fleshing on it. And then uh, it's going to go back in the pickle for another day. And then we'll take it out, put it in a neutralizing solution for a little while. And uh, get the moisture off of, off of it, then we'll put the tan on it. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to do some final fleshing on the face. You can see we got you know heavy meat around the eyes, around the lips, some on the ears. We have to get the meat off, otherwise bugs will come in and they'll eat on there. Then the hair will fall out, and and then we're going to uh, thin the lips out. So it, you know, it's nice and thin, so it don't shrink shrink as much. Yeah, so we're just gonna start cutting the meat off. It takes a while, but I'm retired. I got all day, and it's gonna make the hide a lot softer, easier to stretch, and you gotta be careful so you don't uh, cut through, make holes, because if you make a hole, you gotta sew it up. The black dots here, this is uh, like hair follicles. Because when you turn it around, you'll see the, the whiskers in that. So you try not to cut, cut the, the balls. You don't want, you know, the whiskers to fall out. So you got to be careful going around them. And I'll take a knife. I'll kind of get in here and I'll separate them. And you have your finger underneath so you can feel where you're cutting. So you don't cut too deep. You can see how that, how that will separate. Then uh, the whiskers will stand out better. And... Uh, we don't need all of this, so I'm just going to cut, cut a bunch of this right off. And like you can see the whiskers kind of stick out, so you want to keep them tucked in so you don't cut them off when you're uh, thinning the meat off the lips. And on the front feet, there's like three, three little pads. So you have to push up, cut, push up, and cut. And you'll see it, you know, it's changing color, so it's getting thinner. And with my finger being in here in the foot, you can feel the thickness. So you can just keep, you know, pushing and cutting. And you got to make sure that you don't cut the bottom of the foot. Because I can feel it's getting pretty thin right there. So I'm going to kind of stop for now. And having a good sharp pair of scissors really works well. And that feels pretty good because I can, I can feel that it's real thin. So that's as far as I'm going to pretty much go for now. I don't want to you know, make a hole if I don't have to. And the more you get off, the, the softer the hide's going to be. It's just going to make the tan soak in better. And you still got to be real careful not to cut through the hide. And then... What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put it back in the pickle now for another day so uh, the pickle can work where I cut the meat off. So I'm just going to put it right back in and we'll cover it up and tomorrow's another day. <laughs> While we're waiting for Mr. Coyote to get pickled, we'll take a look at some of the other critters found hanging around Dave's garage. With the beaver, there, I, you know, I do them a couple different ways. You know, some people like them with the round with the hoop. And uh, some people just like them case skinned out. I leave the feet on. I can skin out the tail and it's all tanned. It's not going to go to heck or anything. A lot of people do like the, the rings. And I do sew the legs up so you don't see through them when, you know, when they dry and stretch. What I'll do with the skunks, I'll go in and I'll take out the stink sack. So then you can uh, skin them like any other animal. And I do like to leave the feet on them. It just, I don't know, to me it makes the animal look better. You know, makes it like one whole animal instead of having the, the feet cut off. Same thing with all animals. You can just take them upside down, shake them, and, you know, it you know, just fluffs the, the fur back up, makes them look a lot nicer. This is an early season coon. Fur ain't real heavy on it. You know, same thing. I, I'll skin the, you know, the feet out on the raccoons. The hide really turned out nice on it. It's nice and soft. Fox are, you know, pretty much the same thing. Turn them upside down. You know, don't grab it by the tail. Grab it by the back of the animal and you could shake it and, you know, it just makes them, the hides look a lot nicer. This is a gray fox. I lost one foot on it, but sometimes that happens with trapping. Just take them, shake them. And this pail, I got a weasel 
that I'm gonna mount instead of uh, just tan. When you do the mounting, you kind of skin them a little bit different. This one is skinned down the back. So when I put it on the mount, I can just fit it and then I just gotta sew up the back. You don't have to cut it all the way. I just cut it like between the shoulder blades to the base of the tail. And then when I put it on the mount, I can just slide it on. We can do one woodchucks. I'll, I can tan just about, you know, anything. And the same thing, leave the feet on. On a porcupine though, be careful when you, uh, to shake it, to clean it, because it still does have the quills. And they're all through the animal on the head. And they are very sharp. They will still stick in you. I took the Cayute out of the, out of the pickle. I put it in neutralizing solution. The neutralizing solution is just uh, three gallons of water. And for every gallon of water, I put in a teaspoon of baking soda. And that's gonna neutralize the acid and, you know, that we had it sitting in for the you know, last three, four days. What I like to do is get the ears first, squeeze the water out that way, it don't splash back at you. Then I'll just start from the head and I'll just start wringing the water out as much as I can get out. We had it in the neutralizing solution for a half hour. So now I can take it out and I'm going to put it in a towel and I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to let it set for like 15 minutes. Then I can take it out out of the towel and then I can uh, apply the tan to the hide. I'll take the legs and I'll hold them up so I can squeeze the water out of the legs also. Start by just stretching it out as I go so everything lays flat really nice and flat because we want to get off as much moisture right now as we can so just what I'm gonna do now is just fold the towel up on it both sides and we're just gonna roll it right up okay it's been 15 minutes now so we're gonna take the coyote back out of the towel I'm just gonna lay it on the plastic bag here and this is the Mackenzie tan that I use. And this is a, a brush on tan. So all you do is you just kind of pour it, pour a little bit, not a whole lot at a time. And then we're just gonna brush it right into the skin. What the tan's gonna do is it's gonna turn the, the hide into like into leather. That's gonna preserve the hide and like a leather coat. As long as you take care of it, it'll last forever there's a hole or something you want to fill it in, make sure you get it all over. And I want to make sure you get the armpits. I'm going to get down the legs, the feet, in between the toes. I'm going to get on the back side of the leg. And you want to make sure you get the whole animal. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just fold this all inside as I go. As I got the top part of the face, I got all this up to here. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to roll it back to where I had uh, stopped. Then I'm going to start doing here. And on the mouth where you split the lip, you want to make sure you get in there. Because I'm going to open up the tail as I go and I'm just going to brush it down the tail. You want to make sure you, you get up on the sides. If you get a little bit on the fur, it don't really matter because we're going to be rinsing it and washing it one more time and you keep brushing you make sure that the fur is turned all the way back so you can get right to the end same thing with the back I'm gonna make sure I get the tan on all this all the skin on the feet the pads because what we're gonna do now is I'm, I'm gonna just roll it all up I'll come back and we'll wash it rinse it and I'll also wash it in the with some shampoo, make the fur real nice and soft. And We'll be back next week with the final step of our coyote tanning project. As our seasons transition, so does how we use our trails. 
Snowmobile trails become ATV trails, and snowshoe and cross-country trails become hiking and mountain biking trails. There are two things the UP has no shortage of, trails and volunteers. In the spring, trails need to be cleared of downed trees, brush, and leaves to help make the biking or hiking experience more enjoyable. 40 miles of these trails can be found in Copper Harbor. We're starting on Moose and Lewis. We're on Little Loon almost finishing, and then we'll come back a bit more trail on Moose and Lewis, and then go a little bit on Chipmunk Run, and then get back to the lodge. We manage almost 40 miles of trails here in Copper Harbor. Um, these are all non-motorized, human-powered, mixed-use trails. So they're open for people to go hiking, mountain biking, trail running, and then really anything um, that you want to go do outside, whether that's bird watching or photography. People use our trails for berry picking. They're out picking mushrooms during the summer and fall as well. Um, and then in the wintertime, people can ski and snowshoe on our trails. Um, though we don't groom a lot of our trails, they are open for backcountry skiing as well got trails that go out to High Rock Bay at the very tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula on our point trail. Um, we've got trails that go up to the top of Brockway Mountain here um, so you get those spectacular views out over the landscape. Uh, we've got trails up and along the Garden Brook Valley, um, trails out and around the Keweenaw Mountain Lodge, some really old historic trails that lead back to town from the lodge um, down to Lake Manganese and Manganese Falls. So the Copper Harbor Trails Club, we officially were founded in the late 2000s, so 2008, 2009 is when our organization was um, created, but volunteers were managing the trails long before that. Um, the first trails in this area were being built by volunteers in the early 1990s. So volunteers are incredibly important for our organization and other nonprofits like ours. Um, I'm our only current full-time staff person. Um, as executive director, I don't have the capacity myself to maintain 40 miles of awesome trails around in Copper Harbor. Um, and so we have volunteer work days throughout the summer uh, where we'll tackle particular jobs, whether it's rebuilding bridges, boardwalks, and things like that. Um, but in the beginning of every season, we have to open up our trails so that they are safe and ready to ride and hike um, every year. And so that is probably the biggest task of all that we have um, every season is to open up those trails because we have to physically go through every trail at least once, if not twice, to chainsaw out all of the trees that have fallen throughout the winter, um, all the branches. Then we have to leaf blow or rake off all of the pine needles, the leaves, the loose rocks, acorns, and things like that from the trail surface so that we've got good traction and people aren't tripping and falling on all these debris. So all of that work, it requires people to go out and hike these trails once or twice, and it's a lot of trail mileage. But fortunately, people are really excited to come out and do that work because they know at the end, we can finally get our trails open and ready, and it's just gonna be an awesome summer. I can feel it. Uh, we've got 32 volunteers so far, and we might have some late stragglers here coming up. And that's just our first work day. Uh, we've got a beautiful day today, um, kind of mid 40s, maybe hit 50 degrees today. But probably the most important thing that's been bringing people out on such a beautiful day is they know that there's no bugs right now. Uh, we all know how the bugs are in the UP. And if you can do all of this awesome trail work and all your yard work before the bugs come out, everybody's just like, oh, thank goodness. It's a good day to be outside. Yeah, we're just raking leaves and picking up sticks. That's just about it. <laughs> we're also scaring chipmunks. <laughs> Mostly we bike here though. Yeah, we've been all over. We hike in Greenland. This is one of our favorite places to bike. Pretty like familiar with these trails because last year I took the kids bike race that went on all three of these. Yep. Well, I'm just getting into mountain biking, so I figured this would be a good way for me to see what the trails are like. I signed up, they have this women's mountain biking weekend in July, and I was lucky to get a spot in that, so I'm going to learn how to do it then. So the Copper Harbor Trails Club, our website is copperharbortrails.org, um, or you could find loads of information all around town. Um, the Keweenaw Adventure Company right in downtown Copper Harbor is definitely the best resource here in Copper Harbor for finding out information um, if you're here in town already.
Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 Fishing Report, TV6 Weather, Shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering 906.